Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father, today. We want to see your kingdom come here. Amen? We want to feel his presence, and we want to sense his leadership and guidance in our lives today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise his holy name. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today to come exalting, magnifying, and glorifying his name. Amen. We have an opportunity today to thank him and praise him for his mighty acts in our life, for all that he's done, amen, and all that he's going to do. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. My message today is titled, Overcoming the Mountain of Disappointment. You know, sometimes we need to realize that our disappointments sometimes are his appointments, right? We need to understand kind of the backstory or what is going on in the, you know, behind the scenes sometimes when we experience disappointment in our life or discouragement. We need to sometimes, you know, view that as his appointments or his direction, his guidance in our life. All of us know that we have to have some ability to overcome the mountain of disappointment, right? There's times when we're disappointed and we need to find a way over that mountain, over that thing that's kind of in our way, right? September 5th, 1886, Charles Spurgeon, in his sermon text, he wrote this, Satan is always doing his utmost to stay the work of God. He hindered these Jews that we're going to be reading about in Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, but he hindered them from building the temple. And today he endeavors to hinder us or the people of God from spreading the gospel. He hinders us from building the spiritual temple that, that the Holy Ghost is part of, the Most High. And it's by the means of the evil one that delays come. And he continues to go after, you know, the children of God. And he continues to put sometimes discouragement and disappointment in front of them. He's very cunning. He knows how to change his argument. And he knows how to keep by design sometimes. And he has little care how he works, right? He doesn't work by rules, but he works by only one method. And that is to hurt the cause of God. Well, Satan's only design, again, is to hurt the cause of God. And in doing that, he designs things in our lives. He tries to put traps and, and entrapments so that we might step into them. But we need to have discernment, right? We need to have understanding. And we don't need to let things you know, settle down upon us to where we become discouraged or disillusioned, right? We need to have the Word of God, which helps us to come against the enemy when he brings things in our minds and in our thoughts and in our lives so that we are not laden by his accusations and by his strongholds. And we know that all of our weapons through God are what? They're mighty through him to the pulling down of the strongholds that we face in life. You know what? The battle's already been won. The battle's already been won, but at times, you know, in our, in our own selves, we, we sometimes forget to remember that, that the battle's already won. Alexander the Great, he conquered Persia, but broke down and wept because his troops were too exhausted to continue to push on to India. Hugo Gratis, the father of modern-day international law, said at the last, he said, I have accomplished nothing worthwhile in my life. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, he was not a Lincoln, but he was still a pretty good president, a decent leader, and he wrote in his diary this, My life has been spent in vain, in idle aspirations and in ceaseless rejected prayers that sometimes would be the result of my existence beneficial to my species. 
Robert Louis Stevenson wrote words that continue to this day to enrich us and to, to touch us and to strengthen us. But an epitaph he put on his gravestone was, Here lies one who meant well, who tried a little and failed much. Cecil Rhodes opened up Africa and established an empire. But when, with his dying words, he said this, So little done, so much to do. As the human race, we get discouraged and disillusioned you know, at times in our life, and I think we lose focus on where we need to have our focus and our vision. And the enemy, again, is the, he's cunning and he's masterful at trying to get us to focus on the wrong things, right? He tries to get us sidetracked. He tries to get us to look at this versus look at God, right, in our lives. Today we're facing, I, I read a statistic this week that since 1999, the CDC the Center for Disease Control said that suicide rates are up 30% since 1999. In some states, it's up 58%. Another statistic I read is that one in five millennials, that group, they're addicted to opiates. One in five, twenty percent, and 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 they're losing their life because of it. I think that, and if you were to ask people that you know that are feeling this way, they they they've become disappointed, they've become discouraged in life. That sometimes life is too hard, or life is too difficult, or you know they you know, and that's what happens sometimes when we have the wrong expectations about the outcome. We put wrong expectations on things and we expect certain things to be done this way and when that doesn't happen, we become discouraged. That's why we have to have right thinking and right understanding. Disappointment, of course, is a theme in this passage that we're going to be looking at. And The people of Israel were, during the ministry of the prophet Haggai, they were disappointed and discouraged. Many years earlier in 586 B.C., can anybody remember that? Okay. Well, the Babylonians had invaded Israel and they had taken the people away back to Babylonian. Babylon. The Babylonians had destroyed Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And it was a glorious temple. I mean, it, there, there's stories about how, you know, there was no, no such splendor as the temple of Solomon was. The gold and the jewels and the, the building of it, there was nothing like it since that time or, or during that time. But after 50 years, some of the people were allowed to return to Israel, those that were taken captive by the Babylonians. When they arrived, they began the process of rebuilding their temple that was destroyed. The work stopped, and just after a short amount of time, because of opposition from the Samaritans, for 16 years, the temple remained unfinished. God raised up a prophet, Haggai, and Haggai began to prophesy, and he began to encourage the people, and the people responded to the voice of God, and they began to build again, right? They began to build, and, but after a month, they became discouraged again. <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? You ever get you get going on something and it just you know time passes and you get discouraged, right? You get disappointed. But Haggai writes to them and challenges them and encourages them to carry on. And I think today that's a message we need, right? Even though sometimes things look I mean in the world and in in what's going on in the world, we can get discouraged at times, right? Things just seem to be out of control. There's I mean, we're, things are spiraling. I mean, thank God that He's doing things and He's involved and He's trying to bring, you know, like this nation back. But, you know, time, at times we get discouraged and we're wondering, you know, is something going to happen? Is something going to change? You might find yourself disappointed in the work of the Lord. We all do, right? There's times when we get discouraged, when we get despondent, when we, you know, get discontent. 
and that impassable mountain of disappointment is in front of us, and we don't know how to get past it. We don't know how to get over it. We don't know how to get to that place where the Lord is calling us, and we've allowed that mountain of disappointment to stand in our way of enjoying the mercies and the power of God in our life. And that's what Haggai, Haggai was dealing with here in verse 3a. It says, who is left among you that saw this temple in her former, former glory? That was in 520 B.C. The temple was destroyed in 586. It had been 66 years since Solomon's temple had been destroyed. Certainly there are some people among the Jews that had seen the first temple, right? they seen it and and the one built by Solomon, they remembered the glory, its gold and the covered walls and you know the, 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 the twenty million dollars and of gold and back in that time that was a lot. The same pe- people looked at the temple that they were building now and this time rebuilding the temple and actually they were kind of embarrassed. They were embarrassed of the new temple that they were building and they got discouraged. Because they were looking back at the formal, former temple and they got discouraged in their work in the Lord. They said it seemed so small and shabby compared to the magnificent work of God and the glory of Solomon's temple. You know, I'm the first to admit that in the year 2018, the church is much different than it used to be. Amen? It's much different, and some of you can remember, you know, the church of yesterday, or the yesteryears, the church today is much different than it was, and it continues to change, but, you know, some of us, you know, have to realize that God is still present, and God is still here, amen? Memory is a good thing, but sometimes, you know, we can't keep holding on to the past and not looking at the present and the future, you know, we kind of, our minds are kind of wired to, you know, to, to remember the former things and always compare, do comparisons about the former things. And that's what Haggai had to deal with here in his prophecy and his encouragement to the, to the, the people of God at that time. Verse four says, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. In these verses, God reminds the people of God about about the past, but he reminds them that he helped them cross the Red Sea, right? He helped them conquer, you know, the promised land. He reminds them of those things that were in the past. But he says, also remember that I'm with you now in the present time. And, and I'm, I'm always right there. They had heard the stories about God. The problem was the stories were in the past and they had just become stories and then they were no longer living the presence and the power of God in their lives. They were constantly looking back to the past and not living right now and not realizing that maybe this time in their life was going to be the best and the greatest time in their lives. We all focus sometimes too much on the past. I do. I do it all the time. Remembering, you know, some things in my past and how God has moved and God has ministered and God has, in His glory, has been poured out. Some of us begin to think that the glory days of God are in the past and that God who blessed them, you know, maybe that's, it's no more. But then God says this, He's still there. My Spirit remaineth among you. God said, I am still here just like I have always been. I will never leave you, nor I will never forsake you. He's saying Abraham is gone. Moses is gone. David is gone. Solomon is gone. The first temple is gone. But I am still here. Fear not. Don't compare See, that's what happens when we get disappointed is a lot of times we're comparing. 
we compare ourselves with somebody else and we we say, how come you know they're getting this or they're getting that and why am I not? Or we compare our husbands or our wives with somebody else, or you know, we com- we comparison is what happens when we start to compare things. That's when and we allow those things to take over in our minds and in our thoughts. That's when that mountain of disillusionment and discouragement and disappointment can be become real and be and be something that we can't get past. We can't compare. We gotta allow God to lead us and to direct us and to allow Him to tell us who we are to Him and not compare ourselves to others, right? You see, they looked at the temple built by Solomon and they remembered again the, the grandeur and the majesty and all the things that God had done during that time. It says that the old people returned and they remembered the past and, and that's how they got discouraged. They were comparing the, the old with the new. And they, just, they couldn't get past it. They were ashamed of what they were building, so they stopped, they quit, they, they didn't want to go on because it, it just didn't match up, it didn't compare to the past. But God had to raise up Haggai and encourage them and say, I'm still with you. I'm still right there beside you. I want to continue to use you. This is a lesson that they needed to hear, and it's a lesson we need to hear also at times. Far too often we get caught up in that trap, right, of remembering the glory of the yesteryears. But remember, this work is his, still His work. This work is still His work. He stands just as ready to bless today as He has done in the past. He will never leave us right nor forsake us. He will meet us and dwell among us and bless us in His glory and in His presence. Our primary concern today is that we remember what life is really about. It's about Him and His glory. As long as we keep our eyes fixed on Him, everything will be fine, right? Verse 3b, it says, and how do you see it now? God was through Haggai, I was asking, well, how do you see it now? In comparison with it, the old temple to the new temple, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Again, they were playing the comparison game, and they were getting discouraged and disappointed. But we need to continue to focus upon it. There was a, ever, anybody ever hear of the racehorse Seabiscuit? Anybody hear of Justify? Okay, he run, won the Triple Crown yesterday or something like that. He was the, the jockey, I guess, as a Christian. He gave glory to God. But Seabiscuit was another incredible racing horse. And, uh, and he was really uncatchable on the track. And it, it became known that the, the, that the Seabiscuit would, you know, he'd, he'd be running with the horses and he'd get right up to him and look at him. I guess he had kind of this wink in his eye, and he just kind of toyed with the other horses. They were getting towards the, the finish line, and all of a sudden he'd just poof, take off. And it, it, as a matter of fact, it said that the other horses got so discouraged from it that they didn't even want to get in the race. They just laid down in their stall and continued to eat the hay and just wouldn't get up. They just got discouraged. But that happens to us, right? At times, we, again, in comparisons, we can't play the game of comparison with God. Only God is the one that is qualified to make proper comparisons. Remember the Scripture in John 21 and where Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He, he did that three times. Do you love me? And of course, Peter said, yes, I love you. Then, and then Jesus said, well, Peter, then feed my sheep. And he even tells Peter something about how his life will end. But then Peter looks at John and says, what about him? And the Lord responds by telling Peter that what happens with John's life is none of your business. Here's the verse. It says, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. (laughs) You know, don't compare yourself to John or don't do what? 
You know, do what I've called you to do. Focus on what you are called to do and put your, you know, your vision and your hope and your trust in me and don't do the comparison, right? Do what God has called you to do and focus on that. See, God's not really obligated to treat us like others even though He says He's no respecter of persons, but still we know that you know, it's up to Him. It's up to Him. When we live in the past, we downgrade the present, right? The inevitable result will be that discouragement and disillusionment and disappointment will come. We will miss God's presence, God's promises, God's provision right now in the present. If we continue to focus on the past and we don't allow God to do what He wants to do in the present, we need to get beyond the mountain of discouragement and disillusionment. And we do that by setting our mind upon Christ and upon these things that are in heaven and not on earth. We do that by allowing God's Word to wash through our minds and through our hearts and to renew us daily. And not allow, you know, the dust of the earth and the the trials and the temptations and the strongholds and the, the hardness of life to entrap us and to keep us from moving forward in Him. Amen? And it's a place we can get, right? We've all faced mountains of discouragement before and we don't know how to get over it. We don't know how to get past it. And, and today, you know, in society, even people are, are realizing, you know, that especially, I, you know, to be honest, I've thought this, I don't know how many times. I do not know how people that do not know the Lord can make it. I do not understand that one iota. I do not know how they can get through things without God. Because God's the one that, that helps, you know, that we can pray to and we can go before Him and ask what we will and He'll do it. We can, we can rest upon Him. We can place our burdens upon Him. We can realize that His yoke is light and if we just trust in Him and put our faith and our hope in Him, He will guide us and He will direct us. But how can there be hope for those that don't know Him? There is no hope. And there and it's shown in the statistics today, you know, there's no hope in people's lives. They're, you know, they're ending their lives because they're seeing life not as important or, or they can't get beyond what they're facing right now. That's why we need to be sharing the gospel message of Christ with our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers, even though they're trying to make it harder and harder for us to express our faith and to tell others about Christ. Isn't Isn't it just strange that the only thing they want to clamp down on today is our faith in God and us having the ability to speak about God? Really? And they don't see what that is? They don't understand what that's all about? You can talk about anything else in the whole world, but you can't talk about Christ. Because if you do, somehow you're a a radical whatever. Really? Wow. What is the cure for disappointment for those that are struggling, for those that, you know, that, are, that are facing discouragement or disappointment today? First off, we must let go, right? We've got to let go of things. We can't hold on to them. Whatever we hold on to, that's, you know, that's who we are, right? We've got to let go and we have to let God take care of some situations and circumstances. And sometimes it's our memory, right? It's what we've stored up here. Now, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, I'm, I say I'm thankful for getting older because, you know, all of us have, our brains are like computers, right? It's only, they only got so much storage. And it says, you know, they say that the, when new stuff comes in, the old stuff's got to go. Once you reach that, you know, that point of it being full. That's why you can watch, you know, shows that you watched, I don't know, let's say last week and you can't remember them. No. No, okay, you know what I mean. 
I mean, I used to remember, I used to remember everything. And I'm, I'm thankful my wife doesn't remember a lot of things anymore. But I'm telling you what, praise the Lord. We're getting along really good. But you know what? You know, the older we get, we, we, there's benefits. They're just darn right benefits. And they're awesome. But we have to let go of some things. And you know what? You know what I found? It's, it's like, you know, we, how many of you live every day? Okay, awesome. I was expecting 100%, but, but, you know, the Bible says, you know, that, you know, today, the worries for today are enough. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the past. Just keep it focused on today. But, and a, and a lot of times, you know, I tell them, you know, when you go through something in a day, you just, you just wait till the next day and you forgot about it. So you just say, I'll get through it, and I'll, tomorrow it'll be gone, right? But that's, that's a good thing, that we, that we can let things go. But as hard as it might be, we must let go of the past, right? Because let me ask you this. Here's another one of those trick questions. I want you to be ready for it, okay? So listen. How many of you are bothered by one minute from now? Mm-hmm. How many of you are bothered about tomorrow? Okay. So you're usually bothered about things in the past, right? Not things in the future, not things right now, but you're usually, so you got to let go of the past. You got to let go of what's happened in the past, right? And the only, the only, and that's how you live in the present and live in the future, because if you continue to live in the past, that's, you're just living the past over and over and over again. It's just, it's like your brain is like a recycle bin. You just keep recycling the old, same old memory time and time and time again. The Bible tells us that we need to, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, we need to pull it down. And we need to put it under the authority of Christ. We need to say enough is enough. You're not using my brain as a recycle trash bin. I'm, I'm getting rid of the garbage. And I'm putting in the good stuff. I'm putting in that, uh, that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the Bible tells us that we shall live by faith and not by sight. Uh, that we will know, he says, that he, his sheep know his voice. And we'll know his voice and we'll hear his call. And we'll hear what he's saying to us today. And what is he saying to us? He's saying that, that his peace passes all understanding. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Oh, we serve an awesome Savior and an awesome God, but we need to let, you know, sometimes the things that are rolling around in our brain, a lot of times those things that are rolling around in our brain are not ours. You know, we got an enemy that likes to secretly put stuff up there and you just have to let it go, right? So, we must let go. And then we must look up. The people are called to look up in verse 4. They're called to turn their eyes away from their pain, away from their problems, and away from their disappointments to view God who is greater than anything they have ever faced or they ever will face. You see, God is able to help us in each and every one of our needs. There's never going to be a problem too great for Him. There's never going to be a circumstance too great for Him. He's all, he has everything in the palm of His hand, and so that's why we need to look up. We need to let go, and then we need to look up, and we need to focus on Him and worship Him and thank Him. And even sometimes when you know things aren't going quite our way, we need to call them as, as they are going to be and not as they are, right? Because a lot of times the Bible tells us that you know, the fruit of our lips is actually how you know, our life gets, you know, is lived, is by what we say. And, and a lot of times we wreck our own, you know, the, the advances that we make in life, we wreck them by what we say. Because it comes out of our mouth. 
Sometimes our own discouragement, our own, our own, our own despondency, you know, we, we continue to let it live because we're speaking it out of our mouth. The Bible tells us that, you know, that, that words can have a big impact upon our lives and we need to watch what we say and watch, you know, how we speak. But here, they're to look up. And it says in this verse, six times, these, in these verses, God is called the Lord of hosts. Now, the host translated actually means Sabaoth, or it speaks of the armies of earth and heaven. It literally means the Lord Almighty. It's a military name for God, and it speaks about the hosts of heaven. Reminds us that God is greater than all the combined forces of heaven and earth. Oh, praise His holy name. No one can stand against Him. No one can defeat Him. No one can hinder Him in his, in, at the least. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 45, He says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Amen. Bottom line. And that's what we need to remember that there is none like Him, that He is our provision, He is our help, he, he is our shield and our buckler, and He is our provider, right? Amen. The same God who stood with David in the valley of Elah when he faced the mighty giant Goliath, the same God will battle with you, will be with you in battle and protect you. And, you know, when God is big... Guess what? Your problems are small. If your God is big enough, then your problems are going to be small enough. They're not going to be too great. Uh, that a great and a powerful God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, I, I can tell you right now that, that God is willing and ready to move upon your need, but sometimes our God is too small. And we don't trust Him enough to be able to, to remove some obstacle or trust Him enough to be able to do a miracle to show Himself powerful and mighty in our lives. You see, our God sometimes is too small because we haven't heard His voice and we haven't trusted His Word. When He says that, that He tells us that, that He will meet all of our needs according to His riches and glory. His glory is, His riches in heaven are unending. And guess what? He owns them all. <laughs> he owns it all. And He just sometimes, He's waiting to release it into our lives, but we sometimes have to be in alignment with His Word and, and continue to confess and believe that our Heavenly Father is our source. And He is our strength. And He is our wisdom. And we need to not let negativity continue to flow out of our mouth. So there needs to be a whole lot of positivity. Right? And then we must look ahead. We let go, we look up, and then we must look ahead. God only sends people in one direction. I'm, let me ask. Here's another one of those questions. I'm going to just... How many of you have gone, been able to go in the, back in the past? No. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. But He only sends us in one direction, right? Forward. We don't go backwards. So we have to look ahead. We can't... Again, we got to... We got to let go of the past and look towards the future in God and look forward to what God is going to do again in our lives and don't continue to live and consume upon the past and what we've experienced in the past in our lives. Because sure enough, what is in our future can be greater than what we experienced in our past. God is only sending us in one direction, and that's forward. It's the only way we can go, so let's go. Let's jump into those. How many is looking forward to driving one of those cars that fly in the air? All right. 
Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Amen. But see, the Lord, the, in, in verses 6 and 7 of this passage, it says that God would shake all the nations. And there's, in this, it's linked to the coming of the Messiah. Taken together, it tells us that God shook the earth when He gave His law, remember, with Moses, and He will shake it again when the Messiah comes. One day, this world and all its false religions and all its dead works, and all its deception and increasing iniquity. One day we're told that in this world is going to fall to the feet of Jesus. One day this earth and the nations of this earth are going to be shaken once again, and God is going to take control. Hallelujah. That will preach all day long. We're going to see an end, uh, you know, to the things of this life that seem to be, you know, it's, it seems today that we're seeing it. We've never been at this kind of place in the, in the United States of America that we're at today. But one day, the Bible encourages us not to get weary in well-doing, because in due season you shall reap. A lot of times we give up and get discouraged because we're not seeing things happen. But the Bible tells us by the Word of God to not get discouraged, but because in due season you shall reap. That is a promise from God. you got to keep casting your bread upon the water because eventually it's going to come back again to you. When you cast it into the sea, the waves come back and the, the bread keep on casting your bread upon the water. And one day you'll see the benefit. You'll see the fruit. Keep on planting. Be like a farmer. Plant in the good season and in the bad season. You're going to see fruit eventually, right? Keep on planting. Be a, be a farmer. Don't get discouraged. Trust in God. Trust in His way and His will. The things that won't and can't be shaken on earth when Christ returns, that will be His kingdom. And it will stand forever and forever. The things of the Spirit will stand. The things of of God, the truth, and the Word of God will stand. That's what's going to stand when the shaking comes. God's Word God's promises, what you're doing in this life for Him and your faithfulness to Him, that's what's going to stand. That's what's going to be there at the end of the day when the, the earth is shaken. We want to be in that, we want to be in that place that when the shaking comes, when the when the when we're, the things are tore up from the floor up, we want to make sure that the things remain are some of the things that we've been doing that we've been faithful in, and that that we didn't get discouraged. Verse 7, it says, And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. He's going to come and fill His temple just like it was, but probably in a greater way. The latter glory will be greater than the former glory. He says, and again, he says, and in, in starting with verse 9, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. God knew that those discouraged workers, they, they didn't realize that 500 years later, a lot of us don't have the ability to look ahead 500 years. But they didn't know that 500 years later, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be born. And that He would become the sacrifice for all of our sins. This is a reminder for us that, you know, never, not, we don't always know, you know, what we're doing in this life. And at times we get discouraged in doing it, but we need to understand that God has a plan, God has a purpose. Don't get discouraged. Don't take your hands off from the plow, but keep going in the Lord. 
Don't stop what you're doing. You never know how the Lord is going to use you and your efforts. Don't give up. And, you know, even when you're in the, the midst of doing the, the hard work, don't give up. I'm reminded of this story several, several years ago at Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia. They had to turn away this little girl because there wasn't enough room in the children's ministry. And that day, Hattie... May Wyatt started saving her pennies to keep for the church so that they could build an expansion so there'd be more room for the children's ministry. But tragically, two years later, she died. But they went to her dresser alongside her bed and they pulled out the drawer and in that drawer was 57 cents and a note that said, this is to go to the new children's wing at the church. But wait, there's more to the story. The newspapers got a hold of that. And next thing you know, a man came forth and says, I got some land I want to donate to the church, but it's going to cost you 57 cents. So they bought the land, and the word began to spread to the point where they were able to build today what is known as the Grace Baptist Church, and they actually even built a hospital. And this is still available to go and see today. It seats over 3,000 people. Out of the movement of the generosity of this young child, they built in, in Philadelphia the Good Samaritan Hospital. If you go to that hospital today, you'll see a picture of young Mary Wyatt and her saying she donated 57 cents. You never know. You never know what you're going to do or what you're doing. That's why you can't give up. You can't compare. You can't get discouraged. You need to keep your hand to the plow. Consider the discouragement of the young missionary named David Bernard. In the 1700s, he felt a call to go and bring the message of Christ to the Native Americans. Bernard faced certain discouragement as he tried to share Christ's love with those Native Americans. You see, those Native Americans had seen too much greed amongst the American people and abuse, and they had a hard time believing the grace message of Christ. He wrote in his journal, My heart sunk. It seemed to me that I'd never have any success among the Indians. My soul was weary of my life. I longed for death. For two years, nothing happened as he constantly battled discouragement. Finally, after three and a half years, 150 Native Americans came to Christ. That's not many in today's, when you, if you compare, right? But unfortunately, David Bernard, a year later, passed away at the age of 29. It seemed that his work had stopped completely. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> Somebody got a hold of his journals, and they, they, his name was William Carey. William Carey is the father of modern-day missions. It's said that Carey, in the midst of his discouragement, he would start to read the diary of David Bernard. And it was that inspiration, that impetus, that Literally millions and millions of people have come to faith in Christ because of William Carey reading David Bernard's journal. That is, we don't need to get discouraged in our work for the Lord, right? Let's stand today. Is there a mountain of discouragement, disillusionment, disappointment in front of you today? Do you find yourself looking back in the past and comparing? Others are looking at yourself and wondering, you know, this or that, or maybe you're making fruitless and foolish comparisons, right? Do you ever find yourself asking, what's the use? Do you ever want to throw in the towel and quit? How do you get past this mountain that threatens you? Do you see these verses that say, look, let go? Look up and get to work, right? Look ahead and then get to work. 
If you can do that and God, with God's help, you know, sometimes we need God's help, right? To even get past the, the mountain of, dis, of discouragement. We need to, sometimes we need to ask God, help us to get from this point beyond this point. I, I'm struggling with it, Lord. I'm struggling with this in my life and in my heart, and I need you to help me. Disappointment to a noble soul is what cold water is to burning metal. It strengthens, tempers, intensifies, but never destroys it. We can get discouraged. We can get down. We can get downtrodden. But we've got to ask the Lord at times to help us to get beyond it, to get full of His Spirit and full of His presence and full of His grace. Amen? Let's all close our eyes today. Maybe you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You'd like to ask Him into your heart. If that's you today, if you'd let that be known by the raising of your hand, say, yes, Lord, I'd like you to come into my life. I need you to save me, to set me free. Do you need encouragement? Do you need God's strength? Do you need God's provision today? If that's you today and you would like to ask the Lord for His help, the altars are open at this time. I'm going to encourage you to put your hand to the plow. If you'd like prayer, we want to pray with you and ask the Lord to touch you and to strengthen you, to encourage you today. If that's your heart's cry and you want the Lord to touch you, come forward this morning. We're going to just spend a few minutes in prayer asking the Lord to encourage and to strengthen you today.